Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Poland estimates the cost of the World War II Nazi occupation of the country to be more than a trillion dollars. And its ruling political party is demanding that Germany pay up. But why seek compensation now, nearly 80 years after the fact? And what does this mean for the already fraught relationship between Poland and Germany, in particular with the ongoing conflict in Ukraine? Good to have your company. I'm David Foster. A Polish parliamentary report made public earlier this month claims that Germany owes Poland $1.32 trillion in reparations for the destruction and suffering caused by the Nazis during World War II. Around 6 million Poles were killed during the Second World War, 3 million of them Jewish. Germany says reparations have already been paid. But Poland's main parliamentary opposition says the demands by the ruling Law and Justice Party, the PIS, are being used to shore up populist support ahead of next year's elections. Now, Donald Tusk, leader of Poland's biggest opposition party, Civic Platform, in response to the ruling party's call for reparations, has said this. It is not about reparations. It's about an internal political campaign to rebuild support for the ruling party. So what is behind the Polish leadership's recent demands? How realistic indeed are they? Joining us to discuss this in Lodz, we have Matthias Pantkowski, Assistant Professor of International Law at Lodz University in Krakow. Dr. Katarzyna Zedzinta, Assistant Professor in Polish Literature at University College of London and Poet and in Brighton, Alex Sherbiak. Professor of Politics at the University of Sussex. Great to have you all on the programme. Well, let us hear, first of all, before I come to you, Katerina, from the, the leader of the Law and Justice Party. In this total, a very big part is the compensation for the deaths of more than 5.2 million Polish citizens. The crimes committed by the Russians have not been taken into account in this calculation. In truth, Germany has never paid for the crimes it committed against Poland. So some say Germany has paid, others say it hasn't. What, what is the, the truth from where you sit, Katerina? I don't think Germany has paid, and I don't think that Soviet Union and now Russia, has, has, they, they have not paid. I am not sure exactly that doing it right now is the right moment. But I do want to also say that all studies suggest, or polls suggest, that majority of polls is in favor of uh, reparations. So if Germany so, hasn't paid and if the Soviet Union, uh, now Russia, ha hasn't paid, why, why is Poland kept quiet for so long? Um, there is a lot for somebody who is a lawyer who could discuss it or somebody who is a historian. But from the point of view of politics of memory, uh, law and justice. Uh, law and justice wants to show Poland again and again as a country of suffer, as a country that suffered horribly, uh, both abused by the West and uh, by the East. And this narrative, it's simple and coherent, has a lot of support. Uh, among the law and justice supporters. Unfortunately, this policy constantly looks at the past. Uh, and I'm afraid that this insistence on constantly looking at the past basically harms future. Okay, can I come uh, to you, that... Matthews, if I may? Sorry to interrupt you, but, Katrina, you did mention law. Um, and I will ask you, Matthews, why hasn't Poland um, really pursued this um, in recent years? In fact, in, in the last... 40, 50, 60 years, apparently gave up its claim in 1953. Um, why hasn't it pushed for it more strongly in the past? Well, we got to remember, of course, there is a lot of discussion regarding the year 1953 and whether the renunciation was valid. Uh, there were voices uh, in Poland. Uh, the authors of the report are stating that uh, basically 
this renunciation is null and void and has no legal power. Actually, as a lawyer, from the perspective of international law, in my opinion, we should analyze this statement. And we got to remember, of course, this statement was done by the President Bolesław Bierut uh, during the time of the Polish uh, People's Republic, uh, heavily controlled communist government. Uh, and of course, uh, this is also part of the discussion whether uh, this impact from the Soviet Union, whether there was some kind of coercion uh, from, from the big Eastern brother uh, in, involved in the Polish politics. Uh, nevertheless, I would say that on some occasions, uh, Polish government confirmed the validity of the renunciation in 1970 during the Polish or West German treaty talks, and uh, lastly in 2004. And it would be definitely hard to, uh, let's say, repeal such argument in international court, because ideally, uh, this legal dispute, whenever Poland was, uh, whenever the, uh, this renunciation was valid or not, should be settled in international court. But I would like to emphasize uh, that my personal opinion in this regard is I do believe that the Polish reparation claims are fair, are just, they do have the legal foundation, Article 3 of the Hague Convention, whether a party to the conflict is violating international law, should pay damages, should uh, repay for the losses that result as a violation of the international law. So okay, uh, uh, Matthias, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, I think we're getting extremely detailed about this. And I want to ask about the tone of the campaign. Um, Alex, behind me, we have a montage of elements of those protests saying Germany must pay up. And I, I want to bring your attention uh, to one up here that goes, Ordnung muss sein. There must be order, that's in German. And above it, um, a mock-up of the, the gates of Auschwitz-Birkenau um, with a play on the Arbeit macht frei phrase, which is reparations machen frei. That, to me, seems extremely tasteless. There's also another Udnung muss sign next to a Nazi flag um, in that bottom corner. It's, it's whipping up populism and, and the, the nastier side of, of right-wing politics, is it not? Well, I think um, what the Polish government would say um, is that they're trying to, um, to, to delegitimize Germany, the German government, as, a, as, as, as an international actor, to, to, um, to undermine its moral narrative, if you like. I mean, I, I think their argument is that, that um, the idea that, that states don't pursue a politics of history um, and try and get their interpretation of the past accepted more widely uh, is very naive. And, and the, the Polish government is in is great admiration of countries like Israel, for example, that, that um, are able to, to, to highlight the, the, the suffering of, of Jewish people, the terrible suffering, of course, during the Holocaust, um, as part of their kind of moral narrative. And they're also quite admiring of Germany, I think, because their attitude is that up until now, Germany has been able to get away with um, essentially distancing themselves from their uh, Nazi past, but only rhetorically, okay? They haven't actually paid any um, real material price for this. Um, and as a result um, of that, um, the Polish governments that are arguing that, you know, a lot of people have forgotten about the suffering that um, the, the, the Poles went through, the, the terrible devastation that they went through. If you are trying to, to shame Germany into... Um honouring its moral obligations to its terrible past 70, 80 years ago, and you're using shameful tactics to do it, you are stooping low yourself, aren't you? Well, I mean, I think the Polish government would say, I mean, their argument would be that, that actually um, the evidence that they're presenting is, is very careful, it's very well documented. Um, there's a parliamentary commission and, and an institute, the Jan Karski Institute, that has been um, undertaking serious academic research on these issues, um, that they're trying to pursue this through political means. Mm. Um, and, I mean, obviously, you know, you, uh, again, this is the Polish government's argument. I mean, you can reject this if you like, but the, they would say, you know, if, if um, uh, on, on the one hand, you know, they can't be held responsible for, you know, particular things that the actors might say at a, at a particular time that's, that's not within their official discourse. But also, I think, you know, people feel very, very strongly about this. You know, um, as, you know, the previous speakers have said, War reparations resonate very strongly with Poles. Can, can I, can I bring you back in, Katarina? Can I bring you back in? Because I saw you shaking your head. And, and my suggestion 
is that um, if you're using the lost lives of six million Poles, three million of whom were, were Jewish, as a means to get leverage over Germany for something that it is perhaps vetoing, i.e. this um, COVID-19 re recovery fund, fund th that is shameless in itself, isn't it? Yes, it would be, but there are two things that I need to say. One is the time-wise issue. Um, as you might know, uh, Germany will be paying something like reparation to Namibia uh, for, a, uh, for a genocide that they committed at the very beginning of the 20th century uh, against the people called Herero, uh, which is today's Namibia. They don't want to call it reparation, they call it Wiedergutmachung, again doing good. So they don't want to call it reparation. So when there is a moral claim to uh, to make, like for instance Namibia against Germany right now, uh, this the, the timing doesn't matter. But there's a second thing I need to add here. When you look at law and justice narrative, it, it has three major points. One is that Poland was treated uh, really badly during the war, both by Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. And Poland was under double occupation from 1939 to 1941 by Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. And the Soviet occupation ended only because Nazi Germany attacked Soviet Union. The second claim um, that uh, law and justice says is that West also treated Poland badly and the uh, uh, what was done in Poland in 1945, that Poland became sort of behind the Iron Curtain. But the most important aspect of it is that in the way uh, Jarosław Kaczyński talks about Germany, he basically says that Germany is very much like uh, Nazi Germany. So he hints that um, Poland should stood up because Germany basically wants to take over EU and is mistreating, mistreating, uh, mistreating Poland again. So this narrative is very simple, very coherent, and repeated quite often. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to butt in there, because yeah. I, I, you, you mentioned Namibia, and I want to go through a list of a few things where um, people are asking for money or some kind of recompense from Germany. Um, in Poland's case, it's $1.3 trillion, uh, the Nazi occupation, and um, the loss of 5.2 million people's lives. Uh, Germany, having already said it's paid $74 billion, uh, mostly to France, the UK, the former Soviet Union and Israel, given $60 million, it says, to the conservation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial in Poland. I'm going to follow this one up. In 2015, Greece demanded $205 billion in reparations, but Germany said it had settled the debt. And then there's the Namibia $1.22 billion. Who wants to talk about this demand from Greece? $205 billion. Okay, seven years ago. What, Matthias, what, what, what happened to that? Was it settled? Was it parked? Was it dismissed? Well, basically, we got to remember there is a long line for those uh, four countries which have, let's say, outstanding uh, claims to Germany regarding the war reparation. Of course, Greece, uh, as you mentioned, Greece, Greece was in quite uh, a volatile uh, position in this regard. And we got to remember, yes, uh, the legal framework between the Germany, whether the Germany settled the reparation as a result of the of the war, uh, every country has. Uh, let's say a little bit unique situation. Polish situation was actually uh, dealt in a Potsdam agreement, and as we mentioned, the USSR has a duty to transfer this agreement to Poland. But that, but that, but uh, of ask course, you about Greece uh, in particular because it's, it's more recent. Because the relevance, as I see it, is that if somebody said, "Oh, we're going to forget about Greece," they might say the same about the, this Polish claim. Yes, of course, I, I, I do believe there, there are some similarities, but I would like to mention one strong similarity in this regard. I would say especially the conduct of the uh, German occupation of Greece uh, and the conduct of German occupation of, of Poland was extraordinarily brutal. And I would say uh, this is an open wound, uh, in, in my opinion, still. Uh, as we just, as my previous speaker said, uh, this open wound, it's, uh, it's actually never really healed after the World War II. Uh, and I do believe, because we got to also remember and separate two things, we're talking about the interstate reparation, and other things is the individual compensation. For instance, my grandfather 
who was deported as a slave laborer during the war too, was compensated by a symbolic sum by, by the Polish German uh, Foundation. Now we are talking about, I uh, would say, uh, would say about talk, we are now uh, handling the issue of interstate reparation, whether the Germany is paying yeah. for the reconstruction yeah. well, of Let me Poland. bring Alex in, if, if I may, um, and ask you pretty much the same question. If other claims have been successful, then perhaps that strengthens uh, Poland's legitimacy in asking for the, the trillion dollar plus. But if they've been rejected or ignored by Germany, then perhaps that means that Poland isn't likely to get any joy. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I think the chances of, of, of a claim being successful are, are really infinitesimal, but precisely because of the reason that, you know, every other claim is, is rejected, such as the Greek one, because that then opens the floodgates to you know every country that feels that, that that Germany still owes it reparations, but I don't think we should get hung up too much about the legal side um, and um, about the monetary side in a sense, because this is as much about moral legitimacy and about politics as it is about the legality and the the financial side of it. I mean, the Polish government simply feels that the German government, because it's been very very successful in distancing itself from its past. Um, has a moral legitimacy which it doesn't feel it deserves, okay? Because um, it hasn't really reckoned with its past. Um, it hasn't provided any kind of uh, serious compensation, maybe to a, a few individuals. I mean, you know, I lost three of my four grandparents during the Second World War. You know, no one in my family, you know, received a, a penny of compensation for, for anybody, never mind all my, my other relatives. Um, and I think that's what it's about. It's the idea that at the moment, you know, Germany has the moral high ground um, because it has a, an excellent politics of history through which it's managed to distance itself from um, the, the, the Nazi German period. The Polish government feels that, that up until now, for various reasons, it's not, it wasn't a sovereign state until 1989, the, the law and justice government feels because previous governments haven't been assertive enough, previous governments obviously disagree with this, it hasn't put its case across effectively enough. So I think, you know, this is really what's at the heart of it. it it's, it's about moral legitimacy um, and it's about, you know, boosting up Poland's and reminding people of the suffering of Poles during the war. And in the, in the eyes of the Polish government, reminding people of the fact that yeah, the German government yeah. hasn't dealt adequately, I, 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 um, I, other rhetorically, with its Nazi... I, I wonder how much people are listening at the moment, given everything else that is happening, Katerina. It seems an odd time when, when the world is conflicted over what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, when we have so many different issues going on, to think that this perhaps is the most important thing uh, for Poles to be concerned about. It, does it weaken its position within the European Union in any way? Um, well, there is a problem here with timing because the election is coming and law and justice has, well, not as much support as you used to. So having this issue discussing the... Uh, reparations make sense because it makes people feel righteous. So from the point of view of law and justice and their sliding uh, support, yes, it makes sense to do it right now. What uh, Kaczynski also said a few days ago was that um, the reparation will take maybe generation to settle, which when we use the plural generations, we are talking about 40, 50 years, which means he's talking about the battle, real battle with Germany for the next two generation. And he has the second danger, and this is a very real danger, because the issues that the world is facing right now, those are issues that cannot be settled by one country or even two countries. We need global cooperations and the issues are mounting. So we do know that uh, climate change is happening. We know that, for instance, uh, migration will increase due to either horrible droughts or horrible floods. So those are issues that cannot be solved by every one country. So, so from this point of view, Law and justice politics is basically harming Polish-German relationship and, in a larger context, Polish-European uh, Union relationship. Well, and, and, Co and perhaps more than that, it is, once again, um, or this may be the way that it's seen, Poland portraying itself as a victim. <laughs> Poland was a victim. The problem is... It, uh, is, uh, I is just it? That's the point, that's the point. But 
Poland was also a victim of Soviet Union, and today the opposition was saying that they will have their own project, uh, which which will stress that uh, Poland is a victim both of Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. Uh, since both Alex and uh, they were talking about family history, I came from a, a family. My mother's house was burned by Soviet Union, by Soviet soldiers. My father's house was burned by the Germans. Um, so my parents started basically from zero in 1945, actually from minus because they spent a year in hospitals uh, recovering from uh, from tuberculosis. So basically every family will have stories like this and stories which, do, which we do not hear here are the silent stories of uh, basically Nazi Germany exterminating 90% of Polish Jews. I mean, the Polish the Polish Jewish community is, is reviving itself. There's a lot of interest and things are happening, but 90% of Polish Jews were exterminated in the most horrible manner. And I don't know how to, cal to calculate the lives of 6 million people, but it's not just the, the, the lives, it's also the incredible suffering. And the fact that Hitler has chosen occupied Poland for the place to put six death camps in which those 90% of Polish Jews were exterminated. Don't know how you can put number on that, but, but there I is think something, that There is something else you can do. You, you can help in kind, Matthias, can you not? And yes. um, Poland has this border with, with Russia, it used to be the Soviet Union. And, and would Germany perhaps consider moving military help um, to Poland to, to counter that perceived threat at this uh, juncture in history? Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Uh, as my pre previous speaker mentioned, uh, Poland was a victim, and uh, but I, but in my opinion, we gotta remember that, uh, or, or we gotta also observe that we are thinking about the reparation that is going to be a money transfer for one account uh, to another account. One government is going to transfer money to another. But I think so that uh, reparation is a multi-layer uh, problem, and actually a commemoration would be. A actually the first step, the remembrance, because not everyone in Germany is fully aware the uh, crimes committed by the German troops during the Warsaw Uprising. Not everyone in Germany is aware about the uh, Vielung bombardment on 1st September, September 1st, 1949. Uh, and this is one step. And second step, as you mentioned, Poland is now in a highly, uh, per, uh, highly volatile uh, position. It's a guardian of the eastern flank of the NATO. It's protecting the uh, NATO uh, uh, as a, itself, and it's protecting also the Germany. Uh, Poland is now heavily rearming, is procuring, is uh, purchasing uh, armament all around the world. And I think German uh, military industry do have uh, significant uh, uh, technologies, defense technologies that could be even transferred or even donated to Poland. I would like to say that would be very symbolic in terms of reparation, that a country that invaded Poland uh, um, years ago, that uh, creates immense suffering, that stops the development of the country for decades, uh, that decline its uh, broken, its demographic, and moreover caused that Poland fall on into the wrong side of the history, uh, being on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, it would be quite symbolic that this state is now rearming Poland uh, when there is a possibility of external threat coming from the Russia. So yeah. in my opinion, reparation is not only transferring money, but also commemoration and actual real military aid. So the fact, example. Alex, that it's being talked about, shouted about, um, there are headlines is probably more important in many ways um, than actually getting the money, which is an unrealistic possibility, I suppose. Uh, well, yes, I mean, I, I think the money is an unrealistic possibility. Um, and as I say, I think it's it's um, to do with, 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 with politics, moral legitimacy, with getting your version of history across and with delegitimating Germany as, 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 as a moral actor. But also, I mean, let's not be naive here. You know, they, they, it is also about national politics. It's about, you know, trying to put there is an election due in Poland. Um, I mean, it's due in a year's time, but the election campaign is has effectively started. I mean, you know, every statement by every politician, government or opposition, is um, uh, is uh, effectively part of the election. This is, you know, as as the, the other yeah. speakers have said, this is an issue that resonates very strongly with the Polish public. Um, you know, most polls support 
the claims for reparations, that the, the government is on the right side of public opinion. It's not on the right side of public opinion on many issues, but on this particular issue it is. And it puts the opposition in a very difficult position, um, because if the opposition doesn't vigorously support the government in this, if, if it's very qualified in terms of its support, or even it says things like, you know, this is not the right time, whatever, it's quite easy for the government to basically portray it as um, a tool of foreign powers. And this is part of the kind of the broader narrative, I think, of law and justice. They argue that, um, you know, Berlin, the EU political establishment, wants a more cooperative government um, elected in Poland, that things like, the, you know, withholding the recovery funds are um, about that. They're about trying to undermine the Indeed. Polish government. Um, and their narrative against the opposition is that they are cooperating with foreign powers to undermine law and justice um, and to cause them to lose the election. Always so, always very, very so complicated, and, and I apologise for stopping you short, but we, we have run out of time. It's not just about the lost years, it's about the lives lost as well. Thank you for coming on. May I recommend a book that I've just, just finished? I had the privilege of meeting uh, Tova Friedman. The book is The Daughter of Auschwitz. She's 83 years old now. She was six years old when she was marched into Auschwitz-Birkenau, and she actually was taken to a gas chamber and walked out. An extraordinary lady, the daughter of Auschwitz by Tova Friedman and an old journalistic friend of mine, Malcolm Brabant. Thank you for coming on the programme. Thank you for watching it. Until next time, from me, David Foster, goodbye.